Thank you, Stan. It's a real pleasure to be here and indeed to have seen this first year of Cambridge Polish Studies take off with such vitality and energy and to see the interactions already between our Ukrainian Studies programme, our Polish Studies programme and indeed our Russian Studies. So um, it's a pleasure to be here at this, which feels like the culmination of that first year. Um, so I'm delighted to be chairing um, the panel Changing Paradigms. I'm also very happy because it's nice and cool in here. So, you know, people should know to come here at this point in the afternoon. And the first speaker is um, William Blacker, who I'm sure is known to many of you. Uh, William is currently lecturer in Comparative Culture of Russia and Eastern Europe at the School of Slavonic and Eastern European Studies in London, and he's working on a book project which focuses on the dynamics of cultural memory in cities in East Central Europe that were affected by the Second World War, and is particularly interested in memory dynamics in particular. The project arose out of his participation, indeed, um, for which period he was in Cambridge, um, and indeed played an important role in the establishing of Polish studies here in Cambridge, um, as part of the Memory at War research project um, between 1910 2010 and 2013, and he's the co-author of Remembering Khartoum from 2012. So I'm delighted to introduce William, who is going to talk about literature and culture in contemporary Ukrainian-Polish relations. Uh, thanks very much, Emma, um, for the introduction. Thank you very much, Stan and Rory, for the invitation uh, to come and speak. It's really nice to be back in Cambridge and to see Cambridge Polish Studies uh, kind of uh, flourishing. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, actually on a kind of similar topic that uh, Johann Petrovsky Stern spoke about earlier on. He kind of, I feel like in some ways he stole some of my arguments this afternoon. So. <laughs> but anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll be saying, I'll be saying this, kind of the same thing but in a different way. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about Polish-Ukrainian, uh, mainly literary uh, relations. Um, and use that as a way to kind of talk about how we conceptualize national literatures um, more generally um, and specifically in these two cases and also to talk a little bit about how uh, literature also presents the national past and how these, these two different things are um, interconnected. Um, so George Grabovich, analyzing the history of Polish-Ukrainian literary relations, um, talks about how Basically, in, in, in his argument, until the kind of 18th century, um, Polish and Ukrainian literatures were part of a single uh, literary system um, without any kind of clear um, differentiation in terms of national literatures in, in the way that we would understand it today. Um, and even tracing this through the 19th century with the rise of the Romantic uh, national projects in, in the literatures of both uh, Ukraine and Poland, um, Grabovich outlines how there's a very intense process of uh, dialogue, of uh, exchange between the two literatures, even though they're, be they're becoming you know, much more distinct. Um, and even into the early 20th century. Um, so this, um, the quote from Grabovich's article that I've put up is actually referring to uh, Polish critics' reception of writers like Wasil Stefanik, Bogdan Lepki, um, in the early part of the 20th century um, as not necessarily part of a different national literary tradition but kind of part of the same literary system with other Polish language writers uh, from Galicia of the time. And he talks about the lack of differentiation which some of these critics uh, it characterizes the way these critics approach these writers um, and talks about how the structure of these literary relations in, is uh, characterized by vagueness and ultimate inseparability. Um, and in this, the chronology that Grabovich um, outlines, it's only really with the interwar period um, and the politics of the interwar period, and then ultimately with the kind of violent separation of Polish and Ukrainian um, cultures, societies, uh, with the Second World War, that the two, the two literatures finally do become um, distinct kind of neighboring literatures in the way that they, they still are today. And we've talked a lot, quite a lot about uh, asymmetry today and yesterday, um, and this is another point that Grabovich makes, um, that even though there were these very close, intimate uh, relationships between Polish literature and Ukrainian literature throughout, the, um, throughout centuries, it was not an even relationship. On the one hand, um, 
Polish literature tending to provide forms, norms, and conventions, he says, for Ukrainian literature. Uh, but on the other hand, the Ukrainian model um, for Polish culture was uh, more about, on the one hand, ready-made content and raw material, um, whether that's folklore, landscapes, and so on. Um, and on the other hand, he talks, so it's, it's, this is slightly a different topic, but about ways of, ways of behavior and ways of acting, um, kind of ways of life, which is rather a sort of extra literary form of influence as well. Um, now, this is obviously written in 1980. What happens uh, later? Um, obviously, we've talked about there are, there are contacts in the post-war period. We've talked a lot about cultura. Um, there are contacts which the kind of uh, dynamic between the two cultures becomes much more lively. There's a lot more contact after 89, 91. Um, but it's still very much in terms of two separate neighboring literatures, um, which you know, have a lot to talk to one another about, but they are um, this kind of sense of their in being intertangled uh, is, is definitely lost. Now the one of the things that I've been kind of thinking about Ukrainian literature recently, um, and one of the problems that I've been trying to, so I'll take that back, um, sort of grapple with is the place of Russian language literature within it. Um, and I've been trying to sort of argue in recent kind of talks and articles that Ukraine needs to sort of take control of its Russian language culture to embrace it more fully. Um, on the one hand, in order to, I think, um, this is something which could improve, assist the kind of internal integration of Ukrainian society. And I think it can, it can serve as a counteract, a way of counteracting a kind of uh, the manipulation of Ukraine's Russian language culture from outside from Russia. You know, if, if, if Ukraine really takes ownership of that, of that culture. Um, this is obviously, it's a controversial topic, it's a difficult topic. Um, I don't want to talk about it too much just now. But I think that a similar, a similar point can be made with regards to the other literatures that are associated with um, the territory that is to do Ukraine. And here I'm kind of getting into the, the similar territory that um, uh, Johannin uh, was exploring earlier on today. Um, most relevant for us in terms of Polish literature, but also literature written in Yiddish, literature written in German, um, and so on. Um, and you know, if you looking at the kind of literary heritage of the Ukrainian territory in that kind of wider sense, um, it's obviously it's extremely rich. Um, there are a lot of names there who are kind of world world renowned cultural brands in many ways. People like Stanislav Lem, Bruno Schultz, um, Paul Sela, and, uh, and many others. Um, in terms of the Polish, the kind of recognition of the, that Polish um, heritage on Ukrainian territory, the Pol Polish cultural heritage, um, it's something that Poles do pay attention to. Um, sorry, I, I, I'll rewind a little bit. I remember I forgot, forgot to mention one other thing. To, to do with the kind of asymmetry in the relationship. Um, on the one hand, and I mentioned this yesterday in the round table, on the one hand you get, um, with, with contemporary writers, contemporary Ukrainian writers are much more likely to be, uh, to speak Polish than the other way around. They're much more likely to profess an interest in Polish literature, to kind of talk about influence, the influence of Polish literature on them than, than, is, the other, than is the case in the other direction. Um, so there's a quote from a, just last year, Juraj Andrychowicz of the Lviv Publishers Forum talking about um, Polish literature in, in, in many ways uh, very close to Ukrainian writers, feeling as if it's their own, um, something that they can kind of uh, plunder and, uh, and get richer from. Um, so again, there's a kind of echo of what Grabovich was, uh, was saying there. Um, but on the other hand, um, one often hears the other way around, it's not, it's not necessarily the same. And you hear this, this term terra incognita comes up now and again when uh, Polish intellectuals talk about Ukraine, Ukrainian literature. So there tends to be, there's a, there's a slight asymmetry in that sense. Um, having said that, you know, if you look, for example, at translations, a lot of translations of Polish literature are, are, are made into Ukrainian by some of the leading Ukrainian writers. Um, Polish writers are not doing that so much, but there are a lot of translations being made. And probably they're being printed in larger numbers in, in Poland than they are the other way around. So it's, it's, I think it's a, it's a complicated picture. 
but anyway, sorry, back to um, Ukraine's, U Ukraine's kind of Polish cultural heritage, as it were. Um, you can often hear this kind of opinions that um, certain Ukrainian writers, for example, uh, Krzysztof Varga writing about Andrukhovich as a sort of um, ambassador of Poland in Ukraine, calls him a Polish, a Polish national treasure for his translations of Schultz and his kind of promotion of Polish culture in Ukraine. Um, Schultz being a particular kind of focus for this, for these kind of ideas. Um, another uh, recent article of Father Alfred Marek Wierzbicki uh, writing about, the, um, about Bruno Schultz. Schultz wasn't a Ukrainian, he was a Jew and a Polish writer, but he can become the authentic open face of Ukraine in the eyes of the world. Now, I think this is, this is of course, this is, this is all very well. Um, I think there is a little bit of what we've discussed um, yesterday and today of the sort of big brother attitude in all this and what I think Carolina Vigura very, um, I think, aptly noted in, a, in an article recently as Sici Polacy Pacho na Ukraina. It's kind of easier to say this, say this sort of thing from the perspective of um, of Poland from outside of Ukraine than it is from inside of Ukraine that, you know, a Polish Jewish writer could be the open face of Ukraine. You know, when you have a situation within the country where um, Ukrainian literature itself sometimes struggles to establish itself and, you know, already to say nothing of the situation abroad, you know, the kind of the knowledge of Ukrainian, Ukrainian culture abroad is so, um, it's still pretty poor and sort of placing a non-Ukrainian writer in the first, uh, as the face of Ukraine, as, as um, Father Wierzbicki suggests here, is, uh, could be quite problematic in that regard. There is a certain sense among some Ukrainian writers that these kind of ideas are, in some ways perhaps, dangerous, potentially harmful. You know? That we start to incorporate things that are not Ukrainian into what we consider Ukrainian, and then we get a situation where things are being uh, diluted, things are being muddied, and what is Ukrainian could eventually be actually be lost. Because you, the, the Ukrainian, uh, you know, the right, if, if you look on the kind of global scale, writers, Ukrainian writers are, are kind of so um, far down the, the pecking order in terms of how well they are known in the world. Uh, compared to some of the Russian language writers, Polish language writers who we can associate with Ukraine, um, won't they be kind of lost if we start to make, to, to use this kind of much more universal conception of Ukrainian culture? And so you get uh, kind of uh, statements of this kind from Taras Prochasko. Um, a kind of familiar idea um, that the sort of literature remains the last, the kind of true territory of the national identity and the language. Um, and he says, you know, the devil's next step in his winning game will be to make us consider all that is written in different languages in this country Ukrainian. Now, this is referring first and foremost to Russian, Russian literature. Yeah? Um, if, we take, if we go down this road, then what's Ukrainian will, will eventually be lost, probably. Yeah? Um, and this, this was written in the context of the Yanukovych government, whereby elsewhere in the same article, we, uh, Prochasko argues that basically we don't have a Ukrainian government, we don't have a Ukrainian state, we don't have a Ukrainian elite anymore, all we have left, left is our literature. Yeah? Um, I mean, I, I would say that I disagree with this, with this idea, but I can see definitely where it comes from, and I think, it's, I think we can all understand where it comes from, with the experience of the cultural policies, if it can be called that, of the Yanukovych, Tabachnik government, um, and with the influence of Russia as well. Um, it's easy to see where, where this comes from. But I think that there is a case, a quite compelling case, uh, for understanding Ukrainian literature in this, in this kind of wider sense. Um, I think on the one hand, um, it, allows, it certainly allows for a better understanding of Ukrainian culture in itself, of its interaction with its neighbours. Um, it allows for a better under understanding of local history, local identities, local cultures within Ukraine, um, of particular cities and regions. But I think that also this, this kind of vision of Ukrainian culture can be very useful. I think that it can score points for Ukraine abroad. It can be good for Ukraine's image. 
And I think in this sense, the Polish experience is actually quite instructive uh, in many ways. Um, Poland's um, process of coming to terms with its relations, particularly with Jews, with Germans, has been um, a very important part, I think, of its sort of reintegration into Europe, into the West, into the EU. Um, so just to, to cite Joanna Michlik, current political elites have realized that praising the lost multi-ethnic past and commemorating the Holocaust are key means to gain respectability and visible international status in the West and an effective way to show that the country is free of its past anti-Semitic xenophobic traditions. Yeah, so there's, there's definitely a usefulness about this kind of um, discourse. And I think literature and culture are definitely uh, an important part of it as well. Now, of course, this process is, this is a kind of dual process. Yeah, on the one hand, the um, facing up to the so-called dark past, to use the kind of cliche, may ease the way into sort of reintegration into Europe, into the West, and so on. On the other hand, the more guarantees there are that that integration will take place, the easier it becomes to, to, um, uh, to follow those processes. This is the key difference between Poland and Ukraine, I guess. What Poland had over the last 15 to 20 years um, was were political guarantees, were certain stabilities, which Ukraine has not had and, and certainly doesn't have today. You know, it, it, it's, the, it's the complete opposite situation in Ukraine today. So the process is much more difficult. Um, and I think in many ways this, to me anyway, this explains certain differences between the ways that Polish culture, Polish literature, and Ukrainian literature and culture have looked at the past, at the multi-ethnic past. Um, in Poland, it's been um, a much wider process, a much more self-reflective, self-critical process than it has been in Ukraine. It has happened in Ukraine, but um, not on quite the same level, not, in, not at quite the same depth. Yeah? So in Poland, where you have the Pavel Huelas, Stefan Chwins, Tokarczuk's, Kraus, Rimkiewicz's, um, films by Smarzowski, Pashikowski, kind of asking these difficult questions. There's been a lot less of that in Ukraine. You have had attention to these multi-ethnic pasts, but it's been less self-critical. It's been less willing to kind of ask those difficult questions. And I think if you look at, for example, um, Yuri Vinichuk's novel from a couple of years ago, Tango of Death, the first contemporary Ukrainian novel about the Holocaust, to me, it's in, in this respect, it's kind of a missed opportunity. It doesn't ask those difficult questions that it could have asked. But I think there are reasons for that, and they're connected to what I've just been saying, I think. Now, at the same time, I think in terms of the, the Polish situation, and I also mentioned this yesterday in the round table, there's a slight gap, I think, in that kind of process of coming to terms with the past in Polish culture and literature. Um, when it comes to Ukraine and relations with Ukrainians. It's much less prominently represented than relations with Jews and with Germans. Um, I mean, I suppose there, there are a number of reasons why that might be. Perhaps the, the trauma of the Holocaust and the Nazi occupation simply overshadow what happened between uh, Poles and Ukrainians. Um, on the other hand, perhaps, you know, the process of dealing with polish ukrainian relations is um, in some ways less useful than dealing with Polish-Jewish or Polish-German relations. Maybe it's not been a priority. Um, and in this respect, I want to kind of return to this concept, the, 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 this idea of conception of literature and inter intertangling of, of literatures uh, from the Polish point of view. So I've spoken mostly about the kind of uh, conceptualizing Ukrainian literature culture in this, in this wider sense. I think from the Polish point of view, it, it can also be done. So going back to um, Hrabo, what Hrabovich uh, describes about how contemporary critics looked at the literature of Galicia, for example, written in different languages but part of the same kind of literary process, united by um, territorial attachment and also certain kind of social themes. This is certainly something that could be, this is a way that one could look at Polish literature as well today. Um, so including in the study um, of Polish literature of the early, early 20th century, for example, including voices like Stefanik and Lepke, people like that, as part of the cultural history of uh, white, more widely understood of Poland. I think, uh, you know, there, there's potential for 
uh, dynamic in both directions here. And I think that it would it could potentially help in kind of mutual understanding between the two countries, between the two cultures, if it were pushed in education policy, in cultural policy, in cultural initiatives, and also through um, academic work. Um, and it can also be a very important, and I think useful tool, kind of soft power tool as well in diplomacy between uh, the two countries. Um, I'll stop there. <laughs>